turn the phone off. <laughs> Perfect timing. We'll turn the phone off here. I will turn mine off as well. Good morning. Good morning. Actually, it's good afternoon for you. Yes, it's uh, exactly four o'clock. Four o'clock, right. Is it all right if I call you Hans? That's my first name. Yes, okay. I didn't I didn't know whether I should be formal and call you Mr. Knoop or Hans. No, no, okay. No. Great. Okay. Can I just ask one more question before we start? The actor who played you, how do you pronounce his name? Guy. Guy. Clemens. That's I wondered if it was Guy everywhere. Everyone was saying Guy and I thought maybe no, it was Guy. No, no. Guy. Guy. French. French first name. Clemens. Right. Cle Cle Clemens or Clemens? Clemens. Clemens. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm Fern Gitter. My name is Fern. And, yes, Fern. And I'm on the committee. Are you recording now? Okay. Yes. I'm on the committee that sets up this film festival at uh, in Toronto at Temple Sinai. And we're so excited to be showing the movie The Body Collector. And we're even more excited to have a chance to have a conversation with you about it. It's so, my pleasure. So thank you so much. So the committee has prepared a few questions they've asked me to, to ask you, but we can go in other directions as well. So the first one is, was your reaction to Guy Clemens, what was your reaction to Guy Clemens' portrayal of you in The Body Collector? I think he did a great job. Although he didn't resemble me physically, it looks quite differently. <laughs> of course, he is 40 years younger, so that already makes a big difference. But even if I turn the clock back for 40 years, he is not my, um, my twin brother. But I think the way he performed was absolutely great. It's not without reason that he won uh, numerous uh, awards and nominations for playing this role. He's a great actor. Did he consult with you at all about how to yes, portray you? Yes, we had uh, long conversations before the uh, recordings actually started. Uh, he didn't know the whole bloody Manton case. So first of all, I had to tell him what it was all about, and then of course he need, he needed to know us, my wife as well as myself. And well, I think the way he performed was with tremendous uh, empathy, uh, especially because he's not a lookalike. That makes things even uh, more difficult. Mm -hmm. The only thing that matters is the empathy. Did he manage to get across the feelings I had? one or 40 years ago, and I think he succeeded, and it's not without reason that he won so many awards. Right, and did he capture the story well? Perfectly well. No, the cast, the cast was great. Uh, not only uh, the one uh, performing me, but also uh, the one performing my wife. By the way, she is a lookalike. She looks oh. exactly the way as my wife did, even how she looks today. The huge similarity. Yeah, I, it, could I just, be, it could be the twin sister. I, I looked uh, up your pictures on the internet and I saw it. And I said, she's got the same hair and the same exactly, gorgeous look. Ex yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Right. Can you talk about what besides simple greed motivates a man like Peter Minton and his collaborators? I think just greed. Not even uh, sympathy for Nazism, not even anti Semitism just greed. Uh, if this would have been uh, an SS man uh, who volunteered the Waffen SS and who was misled by Nazi propaganda uh, and would have gone to the East Front, uh, I could have forgiven him. I mean, many young people, 17, 18 years old, without any future, uh, who were fascinated by the Nazi propaganda and volunteered to join the Waffen SS. Uh, they're not my friends, but I can imagine that a young guy makes a general judgment, a ger uh, makes a wrong decision. I mean, that's that's part of life. If he didn't commit any crimes, well, I can forgive him. If he spent his sentence after the war and uh, became a decent person, uh, I wouldn't uh, chase after him. As for Menton, this all doesn't apply because, first of all, he uh, socialized, socialized with many Polish Jews before the war. His best friends were Jewish businessmen. Uh, he never showed any sign of being anti-Semitic. He just jumped 
of the opportunity to steal and rob as much as he could and came back in the middle of the war to the Netherlands with a private train with six vans full of stolen art and became a multi multi millionaire just jumped on the occasion uh, and above he had also to settle old bills bills with people businessmen with whom he was no longer on speaking terms because of litigation he lost a few uh, business cases before the war one of them was with the Pistina family. Uh, they went to court and he lost the case. And he came back in 1941 to seek revenge on that. Not only on the people uh, with whom he did business, but also with the peasants. You have to imagine that in 1939, when Poland got divided between the former Soviet Union at Nazi Germany and Poland ceased to exist as an independent state, uh, the Russians occupied the eastern part and the Russians were the communists at the time. So they expropriated all the uh, landowners uh, and all the, let's say, the, the, the rich people, they were bankrupted. All their money, all their belongings was taken away from them and Menton suffered from it. He lost everything he owed. So immediately after the Russians occupied the eastern part of Poland, Galicia, he himself moved to the western part, which was occupied by the Germans. So he moved to Krakow. And there he offered his good services to the Germans. And then in 41, a couple of years later, when Germany launched its assault on the Soviet Union, Menten came back to the places where he used to have his property. And he was seeking revenge on all the peasants working on the fields he once owned. And primarily he was seeking revenge on the Pisti family because he lost uh, a business uh, case. Uh, they went even up to court to the Supreme Court in Warsaw. Uh, Pisti was one of his best friends, but they got uh, engaged in a business uh, quarrel, which Menton lost. So he was seeking revenge on the Pistina family and he had the executions of the peasants and the other local Jews in the garden of the Pistina house. Pistina wasn't there at the time, so he couldn't kill any of the Pistina family members. Later on, he managed to track them down in, in Lemberg, in Lvov, where he personally put, pulled the trigger and killed the son of Isaac Pistina. So it was a mixture of revenge political circumstances and just opportunism trying to to recuperate part of the property he lost because of the war and stealing and robbing as much as he could from both polish jews and polish nobility not just jews also polish nobility <coughs> wow thank you that's very informative that gives us a lot of extra background that wasn't in the movie terrific Okay, um, the body collector depicts a very different moment in media and journalism. Uh, how does it resonate in 2018? Well, I try to be modest. Uh, I think that the Menton story uh, turned out to be a lesson for any new journalist who be wants to become a journalist and goes to the university. It's, it, you need a university degree nowadays in the Netherlands to become a journalist. And investigative journalism was, let's say, a type of journalism which was quite unknown until the Menton story. Normally a journalist comes to see a person, writes down what he says or recorded or tape, and that's it. He, he attributes everything to the person he interviewed. He never really checked of what that person said was factually true. Fact checking was something very unknown in, in journalism in the Netherlands. As long as you could attribute what you wrote to the person who used, who, who actually was the source of your knowledge, that was enough. In the case of Menton, I did my own investigation. <coughs> and 
hundreds of new young journalists were amazed by what it means to dig into a story and to do your own private investigation. And I think that's what journalism is all about, fact-checking. Uh, the American president calls us liars. I think we are the ones who dig into a story and want to get the truth on the table, no matter the effort it, it requires. Sometimes it's a, a hard job. Once you feel that you're being used to spread lies, you need to start your own investigation and check if what the other party says is the truth. This guy was a liar. I mean, he denied everything. And for some reason, I smelled that he was lying. Although, in the first meeting which I had with him, I still had serious doubts. But these doubts vanished within a couple of hours when he started to call me every 15 minutes at my home. I was living all, um, almost five kilometers away from him. And when I left, when I saw him the first time, before I came home, he already telephoned with my wife. And uh, that went on during the whole weekend. Every 15 minutes, he kept calling. And the tone changed. And first of all, he tried to, let's say, to be friendly, to be kind. He invited us to come with our kids to a swimming pool the next day. Uh, when he when he discovered that the software didn't work, he changed. And uh, after a couple of days, he started to threaten. Well, that for me was a reason uh, to believe that there must be some kind of truth in it. Because if he was really innocent, there's no reason to threaten anyone. You don't threaten if you are innocent. And then, of course, I got the let's say, the support of that journalist in Israel, Khabib Kanan, uh, who was so confident each time when I called him and when I told him the latest uh, response of what I got from Menken, he gave me new input. He said, well, what does this mumza, this monster think that he can say and that he can do? I remember that when Menken, during my first meeting at his mansion, uh, told me, well, that guy in Israel must be mistaken. Uh, please do call him and ask him to come over to Holland on my expenses so that we can sort out things. Because I'm sure that it must be a misunderstanding that he mixed me up with someone else. That moment, of course, I started to doubt because that's not the, the, the let's say, the logical thing you do if you are guilty. So he's also a bluffer. When he saw that it didn't work, uh, he suddenly uh, changed and he became, uh, well, a monster who, who threatened me and my family, not just once, but it lasted, just take into account, the whole bloody thing lasted four full years. I think he had six criminal trials because after each trial, when he got convicted, he appealed again. It has been the most expensive trial ever held in the Netherlands. Millions, millions of guilders with witnesses from all over the world, which had to appear in the, the Amsterdam courtroom. Uh, and this lasted for four years. Wow. So this actually leads me to the next question. There's often a very heavy personal price paid by journalism in their tireless search for the truth and, and justice. Would you be willing to tell us about the personal price that you paid in your journey? Well, the price was quite high because uh, I got problems in my own uh, company where I worked for. Let me just briefly tell you uh, about my background. I used to be a war correspondent for Holland's largest uh, newspaper, one of the largest on the European continent. Uh, I was the permanent correspondent in Tel Aviv. I covered the Six Day War in 67. I covered the Yom Kippur War in 73. Later on, I became the Brussels correspondent for the paper and also for radio and television in the Netherlands. And then I was appointed the editor in chief of a political news magazine, which was acquired by the publishing company I worked for. It was, uh, it existed already, but it, uh, it didn't do well. So I was called back from Brussels and became the chief editor. That was quite an interesting job. And it was in this capacity 
that I did the Menton affair. So I was the chief editor of a daughter company of the Telegraph newspaper company. Just imagine when I got that tip from Israel about Menton, who was about to auction part of his art collection, that I offered that tip to the newspaper because the original interview with Menton in which he announced that he would auction part of his art was published in the Telegraph, not in my magazine. It was published in the newspaper. So when I was tipped off, I went to see the editor-in-chief of the newspaper and said, I have a nice follow-up story for you. That guy who you had in the paper on Saturday, full-page interview, is accused of being a war criminal by someone in Israel. So the editor-in-chief said, okay, I will assign Mr. X and ask him to check on it. So I didn't take it for myself. I actually gave it away because I believe the follow-up story should be in the same paper mm -hmm. where the original interview appeared. And then after a couple of days, I met that colleague somewhere in the building and I asked him, when are you going to do that story? He said, I'm not going to do at all any story about this man. I said, why not? He said, well, it's a long story. It happened. If it happened, it's long ago and I, I don't see a story in it. So I was amazed. You don't see a story in it? First of all, it's a huge story. <clears throat> And above all, it's a very simple story. The most simple story you can do, because you just interview the one in Israel who accuses him, and then you go to Menton and let him respond. Let him respond to the accusations. It couldn't be any simpler. He said, no, 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 <clears throat> I don't want to do it. So then I picked it up myself and decided, if you don't do it, I'm going to do it. Good now, for you. now you have to realize what happened. It became a world story, a world story. So whatever it became for me, it became in the down for that colleague who dropped the story. So there was kind of animosity because the only way for him to save his face as a journalist was an eventual acquittal of Menton in a court of law. So he started to work on Menton's behalf doing uh, spy work on me, uh, talking to uh, friends of mine, trying to get as much information of what I was doing every single day. But of course, I found out easily what he was doing. So at a certain point, I said to the editor and of the Telegraph, now it's enough. I don't want to be spied on in my own company by a colleague who missed the story of his life. And now, I'm either I'm going to quit, or you will have to fire him. The man didn't want to do uh, what I asked. He said, no, you are too emotional, and you need to take a few days off. You have you've been under tremendous pressure. Uh, you are angry, you can imagine. <clears throat> but that will go away. Just take a few days off. I did not take a few days off. I decided to quit. So I left the company after 20 years, after a long career. And I was one of the most well-known uh, journalists in the Netherlands. I, I interviewed Richard Nixon as the first journalist in the world after his uh, resignation. Uh, I interviewed the Shah of Iran two days before he left Iran. I can go on for hours. So it's not just the Menton case, uh, which made me a well-known journalist. I mean, this, of course, uh, people remember me most of all of the Menton story, but before the Menton story, I already was, in all modesty, a big shot in this industry. So I decided to quit, <clears throat> and I had no job anymore. This was the price I needed to pay. And now just imagine, you have to know the local circumstances at the time in the Netherlands. Although I was probably the most well-known and most popular uh, journalist at the time, in the Netherlands, it was very hard for me to find a job because it was something which was too much related to the magazine I edited. Uh, you also have to take into account that at that time, the media landscape in the Netherlands was very politicized. Every single paper belonged either officially or unofficially to a political party. Mine 
the Telegraph was independent. That was a little bit conservative, a little bit to the right. So that meant that only very few other papers would be willing to, to let's say, to take a journalist from the Telegraph because they had, how do you say, they were known of being different. It was hard to find a job and I didn't actually apply. So I decided to do something on my own and I started uh, a media consultancy agency of my own. And because I was well known, uh, I did quite well. I mean, I, um, my family didn't die from starvation, not a, a single day. And in terms of uh, money, I already earned more money uh, the first months when I started that agency than I did when I was the chief editor of the magazine. But I'm a journalist. <laughs> and if you are a journalist and have that in your blood, in your DNA, you remain a journalist forever. So although I did well financially, business-wise, I never left journalism. I always said to myself, you are a journalist. A media consultant means that you are advising people who, who need uh, publicity or who have bad publicity and want to get rid of it. But actually, I need to sit on the other side of the table. Uh, I was sitting next to CEOs to help them uh, avoiding difficult questions from the media, but I felt more on ease when I was sitting on the other side of the desk asking those questions. So I, I never left the profession. I kept on uh, writing uh, articles. I kept on writing uh, books based on investigative journalism. And actually, I retired as a media consultant uh, five, six years ago. And I'm actually, again, full-time working as a journalist, although I'm retired. You're that's, I mean, that's in the blood. You never give it up. You're amazing, and thank God for you. <laughs> no, so. I am, uh, I'm, I'm happy in this profession. And if you ask me if I turn the clock back, was it a wise decision to quit at the time? Would you do it again? I doubt. I doubt if I would quit again. But at that time, at that moment, given the pressure, I had no other choice. Maybe it wasn't a smart decision. But you don't, you don't need to be smart all your life. People have the right on their emotions as well. Well, I want to thank you so much for giving us this insight uh, and all this extra information. I think everyone's just going to be delighted to have heard from you. Sorry you couldn't be there live, but I think this is terrific that we've done this recording and I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. And as for your own background information, the uh, film was not produced as a film. It was produced as a drama series, of three episodes, 50 minutes each. It won in Canada, in your own country, the Brent Rocky Award, which is the Olympic gold in the TV drama industry. It has been aired in 23 countries, including China, Japan, Turkey, well, whatever country you can imagine. What you are going to see are the three parts put together in one film, but it was never produced as a film. Uh, and nevertheless, although it wasn't produced as a film, it wins award after award. I think altogether as a film, now I'm not speaking about the TV drama, that's a different story. The TV drama was a huge success. Uh, Rocky Award in Canada, uh, nomination in the Prix Italia in Italy, uh, the Dutch uh, submission sent to the, the Emmy Award. Uh, in the United States, but as a film for which it was not meant at all, it wins award after award. The San Francisco uh, Film Award we got. We got in uh, last year in, in Boca Raton, Florida. Whatever. It goes on and on and on. It never. It seems to be endless. Rightfully Although so. Not meant and not produced as a film. It's amazing, and rightfully so. It's, it's a wonderful film, and uh, I know our audience is going to enjoy it. And I'm, we're going to have a discussion now that's uh, at the, a lot of what you said, I think it's going to stir up a lot of discussion. So thank you again so much for uh, agreeing to this interview. If you look carefully, if you see it again, you will see 
after 50 minutes that that would be the break. And then you go over to the next episode, which was aired one week later. If you put it together, you don't see the, the cuts. Right. But if you make a movie, especially a movie of such a length, because it's quite a long sit to see it, right. then you work gradually to, let's say, you, build, you need to build up the tension. Right. In a drama series on TV, three episodes, you need to build up the tension every single episode. You don't work until the end. Every single episode needs to be the build up of drama. You can actually, if you watch it carefully, you can see where the cuts were made. Where did the first episode end? Where did the second one? Now it's put all together in one huge film. We have in Antwerp here in Belgium, we have a private screening for the Jewish community, uh, which was sold out in, in already one day. Uh, people are buying tickets like, uh, like mad. And uh, I can also tell you, Last year, last summer, during the uh, World Cup football in, in Russia, which consumed quite a lot of airtime on, on television, of course, uh, it was the best viewed drama series in the middle of the football uh, in, in Russia, the best watched drama series on French TV, the best ever. People switched from football to the drama series, which is in incredible. Incredible. In Holland, we had every single week, three weeks long, 1.2 million viewers, which was an absolute, an all-time high record. Wow. So I wish you uh, all the best. I hope you uh, will all in, uh, enjoy it. I was in Toronto in the beginning of this year at the Jewish uh, Film Festival. Right. And that's, where it was that's, also, uh, right. That's where we first saw the film, and that's why we wanted to show it at Temple Sinai. Okay. Well, okay. good luck with it. Thank you so much. Nice talking to you. Good luck to you. Can I can I bye ask bye. you, Hans? Can I ask yes. you a question? Sure. At any time during this four and a half years, were you ever scared? Did you feel scared for yourself or for your right. families? Threatened by Menton? He never. He never threatened me physically. He threatened me with his power, with his might, with his money, with his influence. Uh, he never threatened me physically, but he had another smart solution to do so. He hired the Dutch champion, world champion karate, who was also an actor in films. And every single Sunday night at 7 o'clock p.m., every single Sunday at 7 o'clock p.m., that karate champion called me on behalf of Menti, trying to convince me to stop digging in the past of Menton, thinking of my family. That went on for about one, one and a half year, every single Sunday night. And just the fact that the world champion karate would call me every single week should have frightened me. It did not, it did not. I've never been uh, physically threatened and I'm not afraid. Uh, but he tried it on, on, on different levels. He, he threatened to buy all the shares of the Telegraph Publishing Company, which is listed at the time, was listed on the stock market. And he could easily, with just one signature, buy the complete publishing group and fire me. Uh, he was very close with, with members of, of parliament and, and cabinet ministers because he was extremely wealthy. It belonged to probably the 10 richest uh, people in the Netherlands. I mean, it was out of this world. And he was very smart. Just imagine that this, this, this monster managed to get from the German government in 1948, after the war, 550,000 German marks compensation because he presented himself as a victim of Nazism of Nazism, wow. because he had to leave Poland and had to leave all his property behind. He didn't leave anything behind. He came with his own train with six vans loaded full of rot art. But he managed to get 550,000 German marks compensation. 
Fortunately, when I revealed his past 40 years later, 35 years later, he had to pay it back with interest. Millions of German marks he needed to pay back. But as for the stolen property, he could keep it. I mean, <clears throat> no one could touch it. There was a statute of limitation that no one, no one could reclaim their, their stolen property. So uh, he died as a multi, multi, multi millionaire. But in jail? No, he he's, he lived another eight months, I think, after his release. But he has the old Alzheimer at the time. And the fact that he spent altogether effectively something like eight years in jail gives me a lot of satisfaction. Uh, it gives a good feeling. That's that's. And it's worth that's losing your job for it. Wow. And so none of the paintings were ever reclaimed, reclaimed. by by their yeah. owners. No. And where no. are they now? That's the good question which on which I don't have the answer. I mean, he had no children. Uh, he had a brother who died before he died, the one who also appears in the film, the one who lives in who lived in Cam in, in France. Uh, also a Nazi collaborator, although not a murderer. Uh, but Menten had no children, neither with his first wife nor with the second one. Uh, there are rumors, but I'm unable to, to check them because he must have had a, a last will or a testament, how do you say that in English, a last will. Mm -hmm. But a last will is secret, only the notary uh, has access to it or someone who has been mentioned in the last will to take care of, how do you say, of, of, of the, the way uh, the money or the property should be divided or to whom it should go. The executor, that, right. Yes, I mean, that's all secret. There are indications that all of it, or at least most of it, went to the daughter of the German SS general with whom he was close and with whom he robbed the art together, General Schungart, and with whom he also had to leave Poland. You have to imagine that in 1943, Menten got an SS trial in Krakow, together with this SS general. They robbed together. They were friends, friends in crime. They robbed from Jews, from nobility, but they didn't give the stolen stuff to the Germans. They kept it from themselves. They were thieves. They weren't stealing on behalf of the Third Reich. They were stealing from themselves. So they got a trial in the middle of the war. And during the trial, it turned out that so many high-ranking SS officers were involved that finally the court decided to stop with the, the trial because it would lead nowhere and too many people would be compromised. But he needed to leave Poland with his stolen property, with that train. And the other one, the SS general, was replaced to Greece. He needed to leave Poland and got another assignment as SS general in Greece. And one year later, in 1944, just by chance, he was replaced again from Greece to Holland, where he again met with Menten. He, he frequented Menten's house, uh, parties. So they were the very, very best friends. And that general had a daughter in Germany. That daughter visited Menten after the war during her vacations. She lost her father because the general was executed in 1946 by the British as a war criminal. And Menten took care of her. Uh, she spent her holidays in Holland with um, the Menten couple. So there are indications that she might have inherited uh, the entire fortune. Wow. Very interesting. Wow. Fascinating. Well, it's a fascinating story. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that story with us. You've given us so much well, extra uh, information. It's, okay. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you for your when, time. When will the, when will, will the film be, uh, be? Sunday afternoon. This way, Sunday afternoon. This Sunday yeah. afternoon, right. And we have about uh, 170 people registered for the whole weekend. We see four different films. Yeah. And uh, they're really looking forward to seeing your film. And, and I'm looking forward to seeing their reaction to it. And I'm so glad that we can add your insight. Just let me know the reaction. I would appreciate it if you would let me know. I will. Sure. Thank you for yeah? sure. Okay. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.